Welcome to the Kips Personal Training Application Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I'm the owner of Kips and Time to Train Fitness. Today we have somebody that I've known over the last couple of years. We've had him on a different podcast with Fitness Fest to give his background. And today with Kips, he's going to be talking about engaging clients for long-term success. We have Raphael Conforti, who is the Senior Director of Fitness for UFIT. Raphael, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Always great to connect with you, talk about what's going on within the industry, your perspective on it, and especially your position inside of UFIT. For myself, being an educator, I know you really emphasize education as well. So that perspective for personal trainers, group exercise instructors, or even those just wanting to get into the industry, I think that that's really valuable information and the way that you share it comes across that they can easily grasp it, and then apply it, which I'm excited to jump into today's topic. So let's kick it off with, Raph, what are some of the ways you approach keeping clients engaged outside the gym? I think that that's really something that trainers need to remember. You only see them for a couple hours out of the week, and those rest of those hours in the week, they're on their own. So what are some of those ways that you approach keeping those clients engaged outside? Mm -hmm. Well, exactly like you just said, you only see them for a short amount of time, but to be successful in the long run, there has to be a lifestyle shift. And there's actually a book that's pretty good. It's called Switch. And the premise behind it is all about behavior change. And the idea is, would you rather have somebody do two one-hour workouts when they don't see you or potentially four 15-minute workouts? which do you think is going to ultimately lead to more success? And the idea behind it is the more frequently you do something, more frequently it becomes part of your day, the more likely you are to stick with that. So I think that's an important concept is say you're training a client for, you know, two one hour sessions a week. Think about how you're programming for them outside of the gym and what's realistic. What are they actually going to do and be successful with? Success is one of those ultimate keys. So with those workouts that you aren't doing with them, one recommendation I have is setting small, short workouts that are very accomplishable that keep fitness front of mind for them. So if you exercise for 15 minutes, that leads into other good habits throughout the day. The days that you exercise, you're more inclined to just be in that mindset where you're going to eat better, where you're going to be more conscious of sleeping, where you're more likely to take the stairs and do all those other little things that really add up beyond that extra 30 minutes that you could be working out. So setting those things out for them is really, really important in a way that's realistic, that it's accomplishable for them. Obviously keeping in touch with your client outside of that, setting little challenges for them, things that you ask them to do, like sending you different pictures of meal logs or different pictures of their food, just something that keeps them thinking about you and the gym are always really successful. I know that, you know, personally, something I would do is set out a calendar or set out some type of goal for the week or for the month. And then you add gamification to it. So everybody loves playing different video games because you level up, you have different challenges that you accomplish. I think setting those challenges outside of the gym for your client are really big. You know, typically we say, okay, we did 10 reps on this exercise last week. So now let's try and do 11 reps or let's try and do 12 reps. You can do the same thing for, right? How many workouts did you do outside of the gym? How many of those meals when you're eating maybe four meals a day were meals that you feel good about and adding some sort of gamification, some sort of score, some sort of accomplishment. And then once they're able to do that, leveling them up. So it's just at the core of it, how can you keep them thinking about their fitness and their well-being when all the stresses of life and stresses of even a pandemic can be in their face and be distracting and lead them to falling back to those bad habits? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's a good one. And before we piggyback off that, because there's so much to unpack right there, I know a tip that I did that I don't know if trainers are already doing this, but I feel like it's very useful is if you're working inside of a gym, you have something great that they can utilize when they're not with you. And that's the group exercise schedule. I would always grab the group exercise schedule when I met somebody or signed up a new client. And I'd say, well, which one of these on here is inside of your weekly schedule that you can consistently make when you're not with me? Because ultimately, what, what we're talking about now is creating success, 
talking about creating positive habits. And if you've already established your relationship with the client and that they can see the value in there, doing a group exercise class isn't going to make them think, oh, I can I can just do this without the trainer that I, I spent X amount of dollars on. And you're just creating positive habits. So I would always grab that schedule, say, okay, for this first couple of weeks, what's one class that you can add into it? And then after a couple of weeks, you see them building up. Okay, what's two classes that you can do on top of this? So now that they have that routine, it just goes into all the things that you mentioned there. And so I think one of the, the topics I want to touch on here, and I think it's a big one, and I've talked about it in other podcasts, is that client trainer relationship. You talked briefly about sending them information, sending them images, text messages, whatever that might be to keep them engaged. What are your thoughts on that, the client trainer relationship? The relationship is everything. I mean, people don't buy training, they buy trainers. They're buying a relationship ultimately with that person, somebody that they're going to trust. I think that starts, you know, from the point that you acquire that client is you need to be really good at building rapport, at being professional, because that's essentially setting the stage for all your interactions, for how accountable you can keep them. So coming back to what are they doing outside of the gym, even that first impression, you just being serious, but open with them, that will change how they look at it. So I think it's important to know things about them, even from the sales process, all the way to just retention. One of those little things that you should do is always write down things that the client's telling you about their life, their kids, mm -hmm. ages, hobbies, their pets, you know, where they were from, their favorite sports team, just knowing things about people is really important. Obviously, you have to find that line. I'm sure every trainer has experienced that client who you, you're training a session and they tell you something and in the back of your head, you're thinking, I don't know you that well, or I don't know why you're <laughs> telling me that sort of thing. Mm -hmm, um, and mm -hmm. that, that can happen on session one. It can happen on session 20. You never know. So in those scenarios, obviously, some people are there to vent and they want a friend, maybe more so than somebody who's teaching them how to squat. And in those scenarios, I think it's just important that you can acknowledge it, but don't agree with it, if that makes sense. It's very similar to a sales process where, you know, somebody says, I don't know, I want to think about it. Or you could say that, okay, yeah, I understand, but that doesn't mean you're agreeing with it. And then if it gets too far over the line, you obviously have to have that conversation. Um, and the longer it goes on, the harder that conversation is going to become. But in those scenarios too, just a little trick that's been helpful is, for those people who want to talk too much or talk inappropriately, always have a stopwatch going for a rest mm -hmm. period. And then, all right, then it's not you telling them, hey, we need to end this conversation. It's, you know, you can kind of hold up the stopwatch and point to it and say, okay, yeah, we got to go. I want to make sure you get the most out of this workout. So that, that's, that's definitely a, a trick for those clients who might push that boundary or just want to talk the whole time. That's a good one. That's a really good one right there. Something that popped in my head that, um, I would say probably in the first month of becoming a personal trainer. Uh, so I just entered fresh, just had my certification, young, and I was told, and I still kind of live by this. I haven't done training in a bit, but it's one of those things that I feel like has become more uh, to the front of conversations and building relationships is certain topics. I feel like there are topics that are as you touch on there, there are topics that are not to say risque, but that they're, they're ones that can go down a rabbit hole. Not everybody agrees on the same political topics. Not everybody agrees on the same religion. So I think there is a, uh, I'll say there's ways to approach it, but uh, Raph, what do you think about that? Do you think there are topics that some trans should just try to avoid? Absolutely. People are just very easily offended. And I think where trainers could struggle with this is if somebody has a different viewpoint than you, it's easy to just nod and say, okay, and, and change the subject. But I think where trainers actually get in trouble is where you have a certain viewpoint that you agree with, whether that's political lifestyle, whatever that might be. And that's actually where I think the danger comes in is because you think that you have a certain rapport, you think that you have a certain background, um, and that just opens the door for them to talk about so many other things that are very personal mm -hmm. to them that, you know, 
say, you know, you're a Democrat and they're a Democrat, just stay out of that. Just don't even go there because it's going to lead to some other conversation. And then that's when you're going to end up with the session where, you know, they come in upset and all they want to do to you is vent about the news or whatever they saw on there. It, it mm -hmm. just, it's a very, very slippery slope. So I just avoid it, you know, talk about fun things, good things, things that are related to their health and lifestyle. You are a friend to an extent, but you have to, you're a friend for a specific reason to yeah. make them happier, to make them more confident in themselves and all those things. Agreed. Agreed. And I think that the, that boundary too, and the relationship can also be, uh, I'll say if it goes too far into the friend zone, I think when it comes time for a sale or a re-up with a, a client, it might get into a sticky situation. I'm not saying it happens all the time, but there might be those times where you might've been just too casual with them on re-upping. And I'm gonna speak from experience here on one that's always stuck in my head because I always thought about how could I have made this a better situation, but it was a client that probably pushed too far into the, the friend and letting them text multiple times and nothing inappropriate, but just friendly texts. And then when it came time to re-up, she re they were re-upped, but then they thought that I just did it without them knowing. And when we did talk about it, it was brought up many times and it was already said that she was going to, but I think that when the, it's too much friendly and you take too much of that leeway, so this was on my, I take the blame for it because I should have even communicated even better in my opinion that this re-up was coming, but it can go both ways, not just with a, with the client being extra friendly and thinking that, oh, they can get away with certain items because if you, the other side of that can be that, let's say that your cancellation policy is 24 hours and they feel like they're, they're your friend and now all of a sudden they're canceling a couple hours before or six hours before and they just feel like, oh, well, I thought we were friends. Why are you, why are you charging me for that when you should have had that that boundary in place with a cancellation policy. So I think that that's really a, a one to really think about as you're trying to create your style of personal training, your professionalism, all those items. So Raph, to kind of build into that more with the, the boundaries, do you usually recommend that the personal trainer have boundaries with times that they can call them or how to communicate with them? Yes, you, you have to have some sort of boundary the caveat to that that you need to understand too is when if you communicate outside of a boundary that is a signal to them that it is okay to communicate in that time too so yeah. you know I, I think you need to set it in the terms of professional hours if you're you know a trainer that's at, up at 4 30 a.m and you're confirming sessions that's a different story but you need to understand when your clients are training the last thing you want is getting that comfortability and they say, hey, you know, I was going out to that party. I stayed out late. So you know what? I just can't make it. Whereas if you had that more professional relationship, that wouldn't happen or it mm -hmm. wouldn't be awkward to charge them for a session in that scenario because they knew they had a session and they just clearly didn't want to. And charging that session too is something that as a trainer, you need to have in your back pocket as that reality check for the client of, hey, you said you wanted this. You said you're serious. I'm going to hold you accountable. And ultimately you can have a conversation, but when it comes in, it's money at the end of the day, people take that more seriously. So, you know, to get back to the question, you, you do need that boundary. Yeah. I recommend setting that from, you know, the first session, that initial consultation of, you know, here's, you know, what you can expect from me. Here's what I expect from you. I actually, when I first started training, we had a, a specific document that we would go over. It was almost, it was a trainer client agreement, nothing to do with financials or anything. It's just, right, here's my expectations. I'm going to be on time and early for your session. You'll be on time for your session. Just basics like that, that just set it, the tone from the beginning that you're mm -hmm. serious. And that actually goes a really long way. What I would just say for that is as the trainer, keep in mind, whatever you do, opens the door for them to do whether if you're mm -hmm. late now it becomes acceptable for them to be late if you text them at you know 10 p.m and there's not a very valid reason now you're going to start to get texts at 10 p.m yep 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 
with on top of that, what I was thinking about with the, the being late and then that fitting into other items there, do you, do you recommend for entry level trainers that let's say the client's late and all of a sudden they still want an hour, but really there's maybe only 45 minutes late. Do you think that an entry level trainer should let them have that full hour? Or do you think give them the 45 minutes if we're trying to set boundaries? I don't think there's a black and white answer for that. Yeah. If you're a new trainer, you probably have the availability to do that schedule. What you definitely mm -hmm. need to do in that scenario, if you are going to give them the hour, is you need to set the tone, hey, today I have the availability, but in the future, you know, if you come in, we'll do 15 minutes, I'll do what I can for you. Um, but right, if our session starts at 12, it ends at one, whatever time you end up coming in, right? It ends at one. Mm -hmm. And I've had that scenario happen multiple times. And yeah. when you have that conversation, they show up on time the next time. I promise you. It's not a mean <laughs> conversation. It's just matter of fact. You know, your yeah. time in personal training, there's no more true adage than your time is money. And you have to treat it that way. You have to treat your time as a business. That's good. That's good. Yeah, I think that that's good. Valuable advice for an entry-level trainer, especially when they're trying to build that client base, but also be professional, making sure that they're being respected and making sure that this client sees that. I think that that's one of the parts that a new trainer will not see that part that setting these boundaries, acting professional when it comes time, when it comes time to re-up that client, be like, yeah, Steve, Steve was super professional. He sets boundaries. He, he, is a professional personal trainer, I do want to re-up in creating that value. So I, I definitely think that's a good one right there. So some of the things that you mentioned before, which was, I didn't really think about it, but it's such, it's such a good one for a trainer is about writing things down and taking these notes about all the little pieces about them, because you might forget, you know, where they were from, when that, where did they go to college, what teams, if that is a, a male, or maybe it's, maybe it is a female that likes sports, you never know. Um, but, uh, you know, a guy typically will talk about sports when you're training them, all these little notes that can come in handy so you can quickly reference them. But when we get to the tough questions with our clients, why are they there? What's their motivation? What do you think are the, usually the best times to approach questions like that? For me, those types of questions are questions I want to know from the get go. So depending on what sort of business model you're in, whether you're the one with the first interaction and you're getting to know them to close them on a personal training package, or if you were assigned a client, you always need that first one. And I'm going to dig into that on the first one. If you ask a lot of open-ended questions before that, if you are genuine, if you show interest, if you are not judging of them, you can build into that and get genuine answers I would say 90% of the time, there's always going to be somebody who just is just too uncomfortable. And I think you see that a lot with personal training, because a lot of the reason people join the gym or get a trainer is because they're not confident in going out on the gym floor. They're not confident in training. They're not confident in themselves. So you need to be able to help build that confidence for them to really open up. And the other side of that is in personal training for us, it seems so natural to think about why we're doing things, what motivates us, but the average person never asks themselves that question. One day they wake up and they feel unhappy or they see a video on YouTube that inspires them and they go into the gym, but they don't really walk into the gym or towards you as a trainer already knowing what that real hot button or emotional reason is for them. That's something that you have to coach them to uncover because most people aren't in that in touch with themselves, even with all the self-help and, and all the, the books that people read these days on motivation and Simon Sinek and all those sorts of things. Most people don't put in the time or the work to do that. And that's why people look for shortcuts outside of personal training for their fitness goals, because it's, you have to be real with yourself. You have to be honest, but that's something for me, I have to get on day one. And if I don't, I'm going to continue to do it because the only way that you can keep somebody motivated and on a path beyond just losing 20 pounds and, and with you for the long run is to continually draw them back to why they're there. 
results are motivating, but what keeps you with a client for years is the impact that you're making on that life and knowing that why button. And that helps you for those hard conversations down the road when they're not doing those things that they should be doing outside of the gym. You have to be able, you have to have that reason to bring it back to them because it's there. They wanted to do it. You're their coach to hold them accountable. But if you don't have that reason, you just don't have any impact with that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I, I got a curveball for you right here. So you're the trainer and you have a client coming in. And so you want to unpack all these items. You want to unpack why they're at the gym, but let's say that it's one of those sessions that's set up that it's, you know, free consultation and the potential client walks in and they know it's going to be a sale and they already have that shield up, that barrier up that it's okay. I know that I'm going to be pitched to sale and then you're there kind of close it off. What is the approach and with that specific personality? Mm -hmm. If they bring up that, Hey, I'm not here to buy personal training. That question doesn't bother me at all. The response is, Hey, I, I totally get it. I'm, I'm in the fitness industry because I love helping people and I want to see people succeed, get the most out of their membership and the time that they put in. So, Hey, at the end of the day, my goal here is that you're, you have better knowledge or you understand why you're here and you're motivated towards accomplishing your goals, whether that means you work with me today or not. Mm -hmm. I dig it. I dig it. I think that that's the one that some trainers, entry-level trainers will have a tough time with when I've said this for years, clients, potential clients, members, they're much smarter these days. They've seen how the industry has been portrayed in movies, mm -hmm. TV shows. I remember, I'm trying to think, I think it was like maybe a Simpsons episode um, for a long time ago, how the fitness industry is portrayed. They know that the consultations is a part of the sale mm -hmm. of joining a gym and being hiring a personal trainer. All that's a part of joining a, a gym. So they know these things. So how you approach it and having these, these, I'll say, I don't want to call them prepared responses, but these responses that you've practiced and that you think you think about these things so that when you do relay this information, because we keep coming back to this, the professional way that you say them, it can have an impact. If you created that value with showing your workout throughout that hour and how you handled their responses to, I don't want, I'm, I don't want to buy any, any uh, personal training that they might change their mind and that you're just giving yourself the best opportunity there with that. So building on to why they are at the gym, why is this client there? Why uh, to create that motivation with them? Do you think that this is ultimately the biggest reason why someone re-ups whenever their package expires? I don't think it's the only reason. It, mm -hmm. If somebody's in the gym and they're not, seeing results they're unlikely to re-up because we always talk about it. people are motivated by results that's why i even talk about the gamification with what you're doing outside of the gym is because they see some type of result that's on paper that they can point to and say yeah i made progress because it happens a lot of times where somebody you know you may be talking about re-upping and they're like ah you know i don't feel like i'm getting anywhere i'm just spinning my wheels and then you have your workout logs and you have your assessments and you can say, actually, here's where you were a month ago and here's where you are today. And you are making progress. It's just sometimes, right? Progress is felt on the inside before it's seen on the outside. So I think you have to have that reason in touch, but what you need to be aware of is that that why is going to change over time. That emotional reason, the first three months, likely won't be the same in six months. And anybody who's had a client for, you know, a year or more knows that those goals change. And the reason why somebody continues to train with you changes, it's not because they need the education. It's because they enjoy the support, they enjoy the accountability, and they know they wouldn't do it without you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So let's relate this a little to your position with UFIT. And I know that you've had a handful of positions with UFIT. Do you have any kind of drills or how, or maybe even insight into how you usually do this type of training with your, with your team, with the trainers? Like, do you have, an, do they do role play scenarios or anything like that? Absolutely. All the time. We have a couple different tools that we use and 
essentially those are motivational interviewing tools. So from the first session, we have a pretty specific process that we teach and we coach on. And a lot of that is just simply asking questions, getting confirmation from people, and then summarizing what they're saying in order to get them to want a trainer. And then beyond that, it's actually pretty similar when you're doing these reassessments, but we have tools that at the end of the day, you find out what do they like about working with me? What are they enjoying about working out training? What could be better? What could I improve for their experience to be more enjoyable? And ultimately at the end of that asking, you know, here's where you were a month ago. Here's where you are today. Is this still the path that you want to be on? Where do you want to be in the next 30 days? Are we still on the same track or has that changed? And so we'll role play those questions a lot of the time. I think what's important too is depending on where you're at. As a trainer, I always had those myself, but you have to have really good rapport and relationships and trust to get good answers when you ask those questions. The last thing you want is, you know, what do you like about training with me? Everything. What don't you like? No, everything's great, right? If you're getting those answers, you're, they're lying. It doesn't matter how good of a trainer you are. Mm -hmm. I, I felt like I was a pretty good trainer and I know there was always something. Sometimes you just have to dig in for specifics. Okay. So you're telling me that you love those burpees. And they're like, well, no. <laughs> so you got to dig in on those questions a little bit. And I think that's where a lot of people fall short is they're like, oh, you know, I asked my reassessment questions. I'm good. It's done. They love training with me. And then boom, next thing you know, they cancel. I'm like, wait a second. So mm -hmm. as a, a manager in the industry, I think it's really important for managers to get involved sometimes and, and chat with the clients and have that relationship because, you know, you may not always have the same mm. trainer there, but you can also do phone check-ins as a, as a manager. Sometimes, you know, just giving them a sheet to fill out is everybody has a different comfort level with telling you what they really think about the trainer, but that's super valuable feedback. That's how you develop a trainers is with feedback. Ultimately, you know, here's what to improve. Here's what to change. And and that's just a mindset for life that you have to have. What am I doing well and what could I do better? And what am I going to do about it? Interesting. I want to kind of want to keep on with this, this thought process right here. Cause I was, when I was a trainer, uh, I'll say that some personal trainers were very protective of their clients mm -hmm. in terms of, it was a dog eat dog world at the gym that I was with that I have pictured in my mind. And if they, if you are talking with a potential client and you find out, I remember this is a Zach story and the person that that's in my mind, he might listen to this episode, but, uh, I remember he, there, he trained this person years ago, maybe months ago. I might be exaggerating. It was a while ago, uh, but I had to go ask him, Hey, you know, X, Y, Z said that he worked with you a long time ago as if, but he wants to start working with me. Is that okay? But uh, something that you mentioned there was about, uh, I skipped forward right there. The, the, the personal trainer did not actually, he said no. And then I had to go get the manager involved. But something that you mentioned that was very interesting to me was with the manager check-ins and potentially shifting a client to a, a different trainer. Do you feel like that is, uh, I'll say a team approach to it and that, that act, you've seen good results with that? Personal training, Personal trainers always have a little bit of an ego, I think, which is mm -hmm. fine. And mm -hmm. it's necessary because at the end of the day, you're telling people what to do all day. So you need to be confident. And I've seen it happen. And most trainers, to be honest, at the moment, won't take that well that, hey, this person doesn't like training with you. And mm -hmm. we're going to move them to somebody else who we think is going to be a better fit. A lot of trainers have a hard time understanding that. Yeah. So I, I think it's necessary for the business. Obviously, if, if somebody's getting training and they're not getting what they want out of it, you want them to have a good experience with you, with your company, because ultimately that's, you know, what they're going to think of is the company, not necessarily the trainer. So as a manager, that's just a conversation you have to figure out how to approach depending on the personality of the trainer and the client. And that's where I'd say, that won't happen so much if from the get-go you build that trust and rapport and they're telling you these things because nobody's going to write the perfect workout that somebody's going to love the first time. It takes time of getting to know the client of what they're going to enjoy, but also what, what delivers results and you know what people are comfortable talking about. That takes time. But if you, if you just think you're great and you do your thing, 
you're going to have that situation happen. But if you actually care to ask questions and, and really get feedback, that's very, very unlikely that it'll happen. It, that only happens yeah. to trainers. I see that that think they're doing a great job, but never get the confirmation of whether they are or whether or what they could do better. Yeah, yeah. I, that was such a I don't want to call that a left field for me to to hear, but I think it's it's great when when you think about it on paper. Uh, there are the difficult situ uh, conversations that will have to come up from the manager level to speak with their trainer and let them know, hey, we're we're moving this client but the team approach for it, but also the outcome for it, I feel like that should be a bigger discussion within gyms. I, I feel like that, I've, I haven't heard that, that often and I'm going on maybe 11 years in the industry mm -hmm. and I think it's a great idea. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I really do <laughs> think that that should be uh, for people listening, they should unpack that more, unpack it, think about it and ways to uh, implement it if they are at the manager level, because it can be a great tool right there. Uh, so talking about tools. So I follow you on social media, we're friends on Facebook, all these kinds of things that so I know, uh, I know that you don't post that often, but mm -hmm. I know that uh, yeah, you like to read. And I can't I don't know the exact amount of books that you read this past year, but I remember it was a big list. Um, what were some of those books that uh, you you recommended? So the, the top few books, I try to bury it a little bit between nonfiction and, and fiction. And for me, one of the best books was Never Split the Difference by Chris Voss. He was an old CIA um, person who would basically go in and hostage situations and negotiate. And those are just very practical tools to negotiation and having conversations with people. I thought that was one of the most impactful books where every page actually has something on it, not like most nonfiction books where it's the same thing 30 times throughout. That was definitely one of my my top books. And then Man's Search for Meaning is just a great book to think about life and your perspective on life. And, um, you know, it's a, basically an account of somebody who was in a concentration camp during World War II and how he used his mindset to alter how he, his situation was and how he saw people with different mindsets and what their outcomes were. So it's, uh, it's just a book that makes you think about how you're looking at life, which I think is important to have. Definitely, definitely. I, I mean, I could, a piece of advice that I'm gonna throw out there, which goes in line with this stuff was that one of the trainer that uh, gave me some, took me under wing a little bit at the beginning of my career, she said that you should read, read a ton, read a ton outside of your comfort zone, read magazines that aren't quite what you think, so that you can be able to converse with others and being able to talk about things that or, or that they like, not just what you like, but what they like. Mm -hmm. So I think that being well-versed in what's current, but also a variety of topics, because I could see that being mm -hmm. a, a big conversation with clients is you, there's ways that you can apply it with them. So it's great that uh, you're big, you're big into the, the reading and uh, the ways that uh, you apply it. I know that you like to do that stuff. So that's a good segue into our big piece here. So this is our podcast takeaway. Mm -hmm. And for when we're recording this, January, 2021, a lot of pieces moving for the fitness industry in general. general. So it'd be great to get your perspective on things and even your advice for entry-level trainers at, uh, trainers that have been in the industry for years, managers, or anybody who's listening, what are your thoughts on the fitness industry moving forward into 2021? Mm -hmm. The fitness industry will be different, but not as different as most people believe, in my opinion. You have to be cautious of the dramatic headlines that you see on news channels, on news websites that are really just meant to get you to open the article, right? the end of this, the end of that. It'll never be the same. People love putting those out because you click it because it, it entices you. What, what I see happening for the fitness industry is I don't think that virtual will take over everything. I don't think brick and mortar will vanish from the face of the earth. They both bring value. What I think is going to happen is there's just going to be more of a, a blend between the two. And, you know, virtual fitness used to be you would 
look at a video on YouTube or you would get a VHS tape and you would work out at home. Like all those things have been around forever. It's just that now they're on your phone instead of on your TV. So those things have always been around. That's always been a threat to the gym and the gym has always been a threat to those other things. So I think you're just going to see more of a, a blend between the two or right now, when you get a Peloton, you have a sort of a gym in your home. Whereas before it was just some body weight circuit you did from a TV. And for gyms, I think you're going to see more of a embrace of technology, knowing that we can't just have a connection. We can't just have a relationship with our members, with our clients when they're in the building. We need to have that outside of the building as well. And so having that connected fitness, whether it's an app or social media, all those sorts of things, you're going to have to see those brick and mortars be more engaged with people outside of the four walls. And I think from the virtual fitness perspective, I think you'll see some partnerships happen through that. I think we've already seen a couple of different ones. And I, I think you'll actually see people, the two industries partner and merge more so than fight each other in segment because they realize they, they need each other. Yeah. Yeah. But it's good um, insight there and for a lot for people to think about with virtual, with training in brick and mortars and, you know, as being an owner of a virtual training platform, these are things that I think about quite a bit, trying to think six months, eight months down the road and how we can continue to grow as things open up and things shift to some type of uh, how they were before. I don't know how they're going to be, but, um, you know, it's a way to uh, try to forecast, but also shift my business and all those kinds of things. And I think you're right. You're spot on with a lot with those things that that you're going to see partnering because we're already seeing that. And you were 100 percent right that those things existed before. They've just become a little more modern. People have always worked out at home. They just wasn't they weren't just posting as much on social media and that companies weren't trying to uh, get bank on it. So. Um, I liked your your ones about popping in a VHS because uh, I don't know when the last time somebody was working off a of VHS, but uh, if you go yeah. on YouTube and I I feel like more people need to get into YouTube and this is going to be my advice because I'm, uh, we're already on it with my new company. But if you go on YouTube, search any type of workout format and you will find pages and pages and pages of workouts on there and they have thousands and thousands if not millions of views so that stuff has been around people watch them i think people sometimes forget that youtube is the second largest search engine in the world in the world not just in one country in the world so take that stuff into account a uh, lot of great stuff in this podcast raph i got to thank you for coming on before we sign off can you throw out some of your social media um uh, platforms and uh, where they can reach you? Absolutely. So I can be found RaphaelConforti.com or all the Instagram, RaphaelConforti, R A P H A E L K O N F O R T I. Nice, nice. Before we also sign off, you got to throw out the recent uh, magazine that you're in. Can you give the audience a little bit of a, a background on that? Mm -hmm. now, so I've always always loved writing and loved fitness. So, you know, the past, I'm going to call it eight years or so, I've always loved writing and um, worked with a couple different editors and was fortunate to be published a few times in Iron Man magazine, one of the magazines that, one of the first fitness magazines ever to actually be around. I think it's been 80 years, something crazy like that. So just wrote an article for their winter issue on just back to basics of weightlifting and simple programs. The thing about, I think a lot of magazine things, they're always looking for a twist, always looking for something new to kind of grab a headline like we were talking about with the news, it's the end of this or, right, the six mm -hmm. moves for that because it gets it. But, um, you know, I I'm proud of the work I put in there. I know it's it's backed by science. It's not just something to grab a headline. It's, it's a program you can actually do and use and get results from. Awesome, awesome, good stuff. People, check it out. Make sure you go find Raph on social media. Thank you again for coming on the Kips Personal Trainer Application Podcast. Lots of great stuff in there. And again, always a pleasure speaking with you. Thanks. Thanks.